So to our first keynote this morning, um, we're delighted to have Kelly Bissell, CVP of Security Service Line at Microsoft, with his presentation, Doing More With Less, Securing Companies and Countries. So Kelly has over two decades of experience working with hundreds of clients to help them to be compliant and secure. And previous to Microsoft, he was a software engineer at three companies, as well as growing both Deloitte's and Accenture's cybersecurity consulting businesses significantly. Kelly is on the board of the World Economic Forum, the Center for Cybersecurity, and Kelly's talk today is going to cover his experience to take international learnings from both con countries and companies uh, on cybersecurity and maybe how this can be applied to Ireland. Kelly, you're very welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Look, I, I don't know what that picture was up there. I think that was before I got to Microsoft, so I look more tired and haggard since being at Microsoft. Uh, I really, as I usually do, I want to start off with a joke. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's a good joke. It's just a joke. And my wife hates when I tell this one. I don't know if I ever told you this, Jackie, but uh, my, 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 my joke is this. What's the difference between love and data? Only one of them lasts forever. So my wife hates when I tell that joke because she thinks it's a reflection on us, but it's not true. So data is out there forever, and it's at risk almost always. So what really what I wanted to do is spend some time talking about my point of view for cyber today and in the future. And what does it mean for Ireland? Because I think Ireland is almost perfectly positioned to be a leader in cybersecurity, not just for Ireland, but for Europe and beyond. All right, so let me jump into some details. I wanna tell you where I'm coming from and my experience because I do think our experiences do change the way we look at things. I wanna go through that cyber, the current market and the, and the interplay between geopolitics and technology and what we do as companies and countries have to do. And then the future where I think it's going because I think it's good to think about where is this evolving and how do we either enable it or actually put it on the right path. And then, I'm sorry, I made up this model called the Picard model. You'll know this in a minute um, as I uh, sort of describe that future. And then just a small, tiny little commercial around Microsoft, like what is Microsoft doing to actually improve the world and make things safer? And again, back to individuals, countries, and companies themselves. All right, so that's it. And I hope to um, add some, or leave some time for questions, because I don't want, nobody wants to hear me blab on for 20 minutes, but maybe if you want to ask any questions, I can stop, all right? So where I'm coming from, look, I've worked all over most of the world that I'm legally able to work. And so I, it's, this is not a US experience. This is not really o only a small, portion, but how we look at the world. So what are we seeing as Microsoft? We have almost a million companies that we protect. So we see signals coming out from really small companies and individuals, as well as big companies and the governments themselves. We are, we are looking at 34 trillion daily signals. Now I'll tell you, that's probably more telemetry than any company has on the planet. Does, I, we haven't quite analyzed it all efficiently, but here's our mission. The question is, why do, we, why do we analyze this data? We built this years ago so that we can keep Microsoft safe, but we're flipping that upside down to be able to give insights to every customer. Because if I could tell you, hey, you have a vulnerability on this particular server or you have multi-factor authentication turned off or we see an attacker inside the network, you can actually take action and reduce the exposure. So that's what we're doing is we're taking this gigantic data set and trying to figure out how do we make sense of it and give it to customers so they can be safe. That's really the core part of our mission because the safer we are together, the really, the, the, the more innovation that we can provide in the marketplace and actually the more products you'll use from Microsoft. So that's a little short commercial there. But it's really critical, 
is the underpinning of everything that we do is to be able to take that data so you can be safe. All right, so how are attackers evolving? And I'll only put up two sort of things here to make it simple, if you will, but ransomware in the mid 2010s, if you will, was really about smash and grab and some broad impact of, of really uh, tr trying to attack a company for some monetary gain for very special purposes, if you will, or opportunistic. Today is a totally different game. The attackers of today are both advanced their technology use, using AI and some other things to be able to attack, but also very surgical. They're going, off very, going after data for a very particular purpose. And so we have to think about, well, why? Why would they go after my data or your data? So I think you have to understand where your crown jewels are for that data and how to protect it. And so I'm not gonna read through the slide because you have it in front of me and I can always provide this off, offline, but my takeaway from this is we have to do two things well. We have to be able to do, be brilliant at the basics. You may have heard that before, patching, multi-factor authentication, encryption, some other things. But you also have to use in this arms race advanced technology to be able to defend against the attackers. In this arms race, if it used to be that they were using scripts and so forth, well, you could use scripts to combat that. Now that they're using AI, you have to really use advanced technology to be able to, to combat the attackers. And that's the takeaway take from here. So it's both the technology and human element of attacks. All right. So how do they specialize? Look, this is a very small snapshot. We're tracking about 260 some odd nation states around the world and another 180 some odd attacker, private ta attacker groups. But I, I popped this slide up just to give you a little snapshot of what are they specializing in. And so some are after R&D at a university, maybe you own propulsion systems for navies or they're after you know, particular uh, non-government entities to be able to understand where they are, or they're after military groups to figure out what's in their manifest on ships or how are they distributing fuel or other things. So I think the takeaway is, is understand what the attacker is after and why, and then what you can do about it. Now, some of you may say, well, gosh, Kelly, this is a lot of stuff, and I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't hire 150 people or 200 people to be able to, to really pay attention to that. And that's, I think, where a partnership comes into play. So I think the world is changing, where we're moving from vendor and customer relationship to partner relationships. So we're talking about earlier that, and in, in everybody in this group it's sort of, you can't go at it alone. You have to work together as a group. And this is where the private-public partnership comes into play. This is a team sport. And this is where Microsoft and our customers have to work together to solve these problems. But not just Microsoft, but Accenture's of the world and Deloitte and EY and, and local companies to be able to keep, keep ourselves safe. All right. Threat landscape, I'm, I'm not gonna read through this, but just know that they're moving from these columns, if you will, of, of nation states and ransomware and supply chain attacks and so forth. This is what I'm most worried about is how these types of attacks are really merging together. And I'm most, most worried about third party suppliers or how your supply chain might be affected and have infections, if you will, coming down from downstream. Okay, so, so what? So how do we make it better? And this is my Picard model. This is Jean-Luc Picard. Everybody knows who this is, right? So this is Kelly's Jean-Luc Picard, and, and I think everything falls into Star Trek in this case. So look, we're moving from individual fragmented security solutions to a platform. When I was a CISO, how many CISOs do we have in the room? 
When I was the CISO of a bank, I had to buy 83 tools and knit them together. That's a nightmare. And then I had to sort of integrate them, and as soon as one of the products upgraded, it broke the integration. That's the old way. The new way is to move to a platform, almost like SAP, but for security. That is where this market is moving. The next thing is I. We gotta move this from noise, if you will, what I think of as threat intelligence noise, to actionable insights. So how do I learn about attacks that are affecting me right now against my, my business? So maybe I'm a pharma company and it's, I, gotta, I gotta worry about clinical trials, or I'm a retailer, I have to worry about point of sale, or if I'm a bank, I have to worry about investment banking or, or online banking. And it's really about figuring out what are the th risks associated with me today in my operations that I can take action to make it better. So the C, cloud. Now, I actually believe that we are, we are much more resilient in the cloud. And I'm not saying this because I'm a Microsoft person. I'm saying it because when I ran a data center, it was much easier for me to it was much more difficult for me to manage the servers in my own data center than it would be to actually have someone worry about all the patching that happened on OS level and all the, inf all the infrastructure security that had to be done. So I think that we have to rem remember that everyone's moving to the cloud, but how do we get there safely? And just because we move to cloud doesn't mean we have to stop thinking about security. So that's the C in, in Picard. The A is for AI. And I'm not talking about marketing AI. I'm talking about real math AI. And this is really where we have to use these models associated to actually determine trends or behavior or other things so that we can detect things that I can't do manually. And then the R's for reg. Goodness gracious, I mean, we know how the regulations are changing the way we act in the companies and, and what our responsibility are to our customers. And so as a snapshot globally, there are about 2,000 regulations around the world that affect privacy or security. And every month, about 200 of them change. So how does a company keep up with all that stuff? It's not easy. And the regulations are actually getting more teeth. We know this with GDPR and some others, but it's super complicated because we have competing regulations that actually don't match each other, <laughs> but also conflict with each other. So I think we have to rationalize these regulations and I, I see that being uh, done right now, or at least the start of that rationalization. So I hope we'll move from not 2,000 regs, but I don't know, 30, something better than 2,000. So I hope we can uh, get to that point soon. All right, D. D is for data, of course. I probably didn't have to tell you this, you would know that D is all about the data. Back to my really bad joke, my dad joke around data. But this Picard model is really, if, if you think about how we, think about how do we create sovereign data in country, or we be able to process and secure data either at the core or at the edge, so at the car, at the train, at the plane, at the, at the pump, at the windmill farm, all those pieces, then I think we can be safer. But my worry is we have difficult enough time securing the core that we don't always have enough effort or expertise to secure the edge. And that's what we have to remember. Okay, Jean-Luc Picard, good? Okay, all right, so what is what does it look like for Microsoft? And uh, you know, I'm just going to show you a quick picture, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to dive into this too much. But all these things are interconnected. So if you're using a Microsoft product, if you will, all those flow through to create those 43 trillion signals, if you will, and then we use those to actually automatically update the products, like Defender and, and others. So this this model is how we're architecting, how we keep all the products in sync and safe together. And so I think that what we're trying to do is bring confidence in a Microsoft user that if you're using these products, you don't have to worry as much, as opposed to in a fragmented model where you have to actually 
worry about each individual product by itself, okay? And then there's more to come with this because Microsoft is moving into the other areas like gaming and so forth. And, and I think when it, when it comes to security, cybersecurity at Microsoft is one of the core strategies of Satya, the CEO of Microsoft, because he knows that without trust, no software company can thrive. And so we built security into the, our very fabric, if you will, of the company. All right, so the last commercial, I promise. This is around the, our products and how we keep them together. And you'll notice, hey Kelly, wait, why do you have Amazon on this thing and Google and other platforms like Linux and Apple if you look on the, on the sides here. Because starting this year, we realized that we cannot really only focus on Microsoft platforms. Because almost no company only has one vendor. Most companies have multiple vendors, multiple platforms. And so we've moved our products to multi-platform support so that, that no matter where you are, you can actually be safe across your platform stack. And so you'll see that expand even farther. So if you run a manufacturing plant, you have Schneider Electric and Johnson Controls and GE and Siemens and so forth. If you're, if you're a retailer, you might have different products. So we have to move in this, in this way, expand outside so that we can really support the security on no matter which platform you choose. And if you say, well, gosh, Kelly, 50 products, and so the next page is just a little snapshot of what those 50 products are. So look, this is really complex. And when I, when I was the CISO, I, I, you know, I, I had to hire so many people that knew so many different products that I couldn't hire what I would call a superhero that knew all products. And I think the market has, you know, if I look at the 25 years that I've been in this market, I think we haven't done well. We meaning the market. And I think we have to make it easier and simpler for you to be able to secure your own companies or countries. And that's where we're going. So that, I think that's all. Um, for, forget this, but this is, this is savings of how we might do that, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. But that's, that's what I wanna leave you with, is what we're going with, the, the world is getting far more complex. Companies are caught in the middle of geopolitics I can tell you that because I've been in Ukraine since day one, uh, virtually, not physically. I've been in Albania, which has been under cyber attack for the last three months by some nation states, Costa Rica, and four other countries. So this is not a company problem to deal with. This is really a country and a company issue. So I was excited to see that we're talking about public-private partnerships because we cannot keep Ireland or any country safe without us, without us working super closely together. So I'll pause there. Any questions, you can ask me anything. Yes, sir. So you made the point that you think at the beginning that you think Ireland is in a position to I do. I think the potential is there. And here's how I see Ireland from the outside. Again, from the outside. And I've been coming to Ireland for 20 years and I've seen it change dramatically. I will say this is the first time I've been to Cork. And somebody told me that at breakfast, this is the cyber capital of Ireland. Now, I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I've seen Ireland change dramatically in that 20 years, super, incredible capability as far as high tech, whatever the high tech is, whether it's quantum or it's AI or it's medical device, you know, innovation. I'm really impressed, I have to tell you. And you sit, and because of what the UK has done, I mean, what, <laughs> you know, what they have done as far as Brexit, you're really, uh, maybe the only country that might benefit from Brexit. And so I believe you have the, you have a, a unique opportunity to, to take a leadership position, especially in Europe,
for around cyber. You could be the Israel of Europe, if you will. And I think it's up to Ireland to, to do it. That's my point of view. Maybe wrong, but that's my point of view. What else? Yes, sir. And thanks for the dad joke, by the way. Um, just in the Picard model, you know, the whole area of trust yeah. is definitely something we need to improve to make things better. Where do you see that fitting in? Trust. Trust, I think, is the very fabric of all of that. So I would put trust in that data element because if you can't trust the data usage, the data transport, the data confidentiality, the data integrity, then you don't have trust. And so, you know, back at us old cyber people, CIA, you know, confidentiality and integrity and availability, they still apply today. And that sits in that data layer. And by the way, I made up the Picard model. This is Kelly's model, trademarked. So if you want to use it, you can use it, but uh, <laughs> trademarked. Does that help? Okay, thank you. All right, these are easy peasy questions. No, no hard ones, no curveballs. You're moving to a multi-tenant. You're moving to a multi-tenant yeah. location from like it's like moving from your own house to an apartment building. Right? Ah. The security in the building, right? So you have some yeah. security in your apartment, but yeah. you're very reliant on other people looking after you. Yeah. You know. So I d especially when it comes to OT, I mean, there's a drive for everything to go to the cloud. Agreed. So, so here's my position on cloud. I, I do think we're we need to move to cloud very quickly. I'm worried about how quickly we go without appropriate diligence and governance. In the early days of cloud, companies were moving and they would give, it, anyone who had a P card <laughs> could open up a cloud environment and do whatever they wanted to do. And the security teams were left out. We lost governance, we lost, and I don't wanna say control from a negative standpoint, control from a positive standpoint. And I think that really hurt us early days in cloud. Also, some executives think, oh, just put everything in the cloud, it'll be magically perfect. That's not true. We still have controls to put in place. Maybe the same controls, but in a different fashion because cloud security is a little different from on-prem security. We still have identity access management. We still have privileged access management. We still have our data control around our application security. We still have all those normal things, but I worry that some executives have said, oh yeah, it's the panacea. Let me just throw it to cloud. It'll automatically be good. So I think we should move to cloud for resilience and, and uh, some security that's built into the, the cloud providers, whether you use Microsoft or Google or Amazon, but we can't stop thinking about the security controls that have to be done. So. I think we should go there, but a little bit more mature-wise, okay? Okay, Any other question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so data sovereignty versus cloud sovereignty. And I'm one of the, one of the cloud sovereignty people. You know, there are two camps. There's, oh, just put everything in the public cloud and it will be okay. I actually believe that countries should have some level of sovereignty over their data. The question is, how do we do that? How do we do that from a cost standpoint and in ease of customer use? Because we could be at one end of the spectrum and say nothing leaves the country, then you wouldn't have global commerce. We have the other way where you don't have any control and you have some, maybe some legal issues or some privacy issues with your citizens. So I think we have actually somewhere in the middle, I actually believe that we can achieve cloud sovereignty with the right controls of privacy, but also global commerce. So I think right now the world is sort of figuring it out right now, but I believe in that, I'm one of the believers of cloud sovereignty. Kelly, just yes. one final yeah. question before we wrap up. Um, our next presenter is from the European Commission, yeah. and I suppose there's been a lot of developments between the European Cybersecurity Act, um, cybersecurity certification, 
um, and certainly the development of European companies and European technologies. Now, Ireland has a very strong relationship with the US. 55% yep. um, of employment in the cybersecurity sector in Ireland is in US multinationals. And I suppose I'm just wondering, you know, will there be an impact from European developments in cybersecurity and possibly even strategic autonomy on US multinational companies and non-European companies based in Ireland? And how do we still keep that important relationship uh, that we have yeah. with the US? Yeah, oh, gosh. Um, I am no geopolitical or politician, so my, here's, here's my point of view. My, my point of view is innovation wins. And so I believe we need, also need competition. If, we're, if we have a monopoly, if you will, and we have a lowering of innovation, then the market loses. But if we have great innovation in Europe and in Ireland and other places, then we can actually have better competition. And so my, and actually better service for the market. So I believe that in Ireland, we have a bunch of big, giant, multinational companies like Google and Microsoft and others. Great. How do we, how do, they're here so we can actually tap into the incredible innovation and brain trust of Ireland. And so how do we work together, but also encourage startups and other companies to be able to innovate new ideas and get better security, in my, in my point of view. I hope that helps, but my, my worry is that the inter-country laws are gonna stagnate that innovation a little bit. That's great, thanks right. very Thank much. You. Kelly Bissell, everyone.